delighted out of the archive a film called Westbound on E Track. It was shot in black and white back in 1967. It's very much in the old style of the documentary, a fairly simple story illustrated with direct camera work illuminated by a fairly basic script. The story concerns a boat called the Carrigan Head, bound out of Belfast for Detroit and then for Chicago. And at the centre of the story, a race to be the first boat to enter the Great Lakes after the winter ice has melted. It's a story not without its own kind of charm and a film that I think you'll enjoy. Westbound on E-Track. The Carrigan Head out of Belfast at the beginning of a race to the Great Lakes of North America that's held every spring and is like no other race you ever heard of. Ships in this race start when and where they like. The Carrigan Head starts where she begins loading here in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Other ships start from other ports anywhere in Europe. They race to be the first deep sea ship through the winter ice to Montreal and the St. Lawrence Seaway and to go on from there to be first into the Great Lake ports of Detroit and Chicago. If you start too early, the ice in the St. Lawrence may hold you up for days, and an idle ship is losing her company about 3,000 pounds a week. If you start too late, others are ahead of you, and the race is lost. But all the ships in this race have cargoes to load and deliver, so when you start is a very delicate matter of balancing the prestige against the pounds, shillings and pence. Once the decision has been taken, there's no time lost. The final stores have been loaded, hatch covers secured, the engine room is on standby with steam up, and everybody wants to be away as soon as possible. From the bridge, Captain Sellers, looking out on a cold March evening, has all the concern of the ship's departure and the voyage ahead on his mind. The pilot takes the ship slowly from the dock and eases her out past the busy lights of the harbour to the dark waters of Belfast Loch. Off Carrick Fergus, the engines slow for a moment, the pilot wishes us good luck and he's gone, over the side and down the swaying ladder to the pilot boat. Most people think this is the point of departure, dropping the pilot, but for the sailor and for the Carrigan head, this is the point of departure. Tory Island off Bloody Foreland, the northern tip of Ireland, and the last time we shall use a landmark for navigation until we reach Newfoundland, 1,700 miles away. We set course on one of the seven relatively ice-free routes or tracks that were laid down about 50 years ago by international agreement after the disaster that befell another Belfast ship, the Titanic. So the Carrigan Head is westbound on E-Track, into the teeth of an Atlantic gale. Bad weather comes pretty well all the year round in the North Atlantic. There's no real off-season, no time as they say when you could get a deck chair out and sit back and enjoy it. But rain, hail or gale, the work on deck must go on. Six fifteen on a chill Atlantic morning, part of the first mate's watch. It gives him time, he says, to organise the day's work. Good morning, boss. How are you? Good morning. Thanks, Warren. Yeah, that's a bit of fun. The weather's improved a little. Aye. Blown a bit. Aye. I think you can give her a good voice down, yeah. first of all. Yeah. And then uh, you can carry on with those full works after breakfast. Uh -huh. If the weather does, if she starts spraying again, the one that looks wet. So, uh, I think that's all. I'll be around after breakfast anyway. Yeah. I'll see you then. Right. I wouldn't be alright that. Okay, I must check that overtime this morning too. Oh yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll check it with that person now. Okay, well I'm gonna get that. Down in the engine room, day or night, early morning or late evening, there's no change in the steady 103 revs. A steady 15 knots in good conditions. 
In the galley, the morning is crisp with the smell of baking bread. The crew of the Carrigan Heads like their food fresh, plain and Irish. And whatever is left over is eagerly sought by the ship's followers. Do the cars on the starboard side over these here on the side. For six days now, the ship has been free from the land. But at the meal this evening, in the familiar surroundings of the saloon, the new sounds of the new continent begin to reach out. News as it happens on CJON, Newfoundland's authoritative news service. City police report a quiet night last night with nine arrests. South of Newfoundland and into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and like the drawstrings on a purse, a dozen different shipping lanes converge and bring with them the ships that are bound for the Great Lakes. Away to port, the Norwegian ship Ravna, site of Arundel, the first of our competitors in the race, and the first one we pass. Ahead of us, white in the cold, bleak sunlight, we see Point Natashquan in Quebec province, our first sight of land in seven days. From Nova Scotia, the ice officer radios ice ahead, about a foot to two feet thick. The captain has to weigh up his chances. If he tries the ice and gets through, we're still in the race. If he gets stuck, as far as the race is concerned, we've had it. But his ship must always be his first concern. It's bitterly cold now, so cold that spray freezes on the rigging and on the hatch covers. But in spite of the cold, the helicopters are keeping us posted about the state of the ice ahead and to show us any breaks or leads that we can follow. We push on and hope for the best. the first lot of ice with no damage except the paint off the waterline which is shining now where the ice has ground it to polished steel and with a pilot on board we begin the long run from the mouth of the St Lawrence River past about 150 miles of the harsh bleak coast of Quebec province to the city of Quebec a strangely European city to find in North America This is where we change pilots, and the news he brings on board is that three ships have left Quebec this morning for Montreal. Three ships that we must pass if we are to be first into the seaway. On the bridge, we hear more about the opposition. The three ships are the Maya San Maru from Japan, the Uranus from Flensburg, and the Cairngarn from Newcastle. The Cairngarns just ahead of us are moving slowly, but the Maya San Maru will be hard to catch. She is light and fast and can make 22 knots to our 16, but the ice may hold her up. The Cairngarn drops astern. Next in line is the Uranus, and ahead of her, the Maya San Maru. I get two to wait. Two to wait.
As we leave Uranus, we're suddenly almost on top of Maya San Maru. 227. She's had to slow right down because of the drifting ice and her lighter bow construction. This is bad luck for them, but they give us a cheerful oriental wave from the bridge. Soon she's away astern and we continue the run to Montreal but with the speed cut back and a general easing of the tension of the race. Montreal and we are first in. The docks and quays empty waiting for this year's shipping. Slow ahead. We move on more slowly now under the Jacques Cartier Bridge and past Expo 67 to tie up at the St. Lambert Lock, the entrance to the St. Lawrence Seaway. Our arrival is widely reported and there's now so much public interest in the race that Captain Tom Sellers is called out of bed at half past six the following morning to talk on the radio telephone to J.P. McCarthy, a disc jockey in Detroit. Captain Sellers, where are you located right now? Just at the moment, we're about 100 yards from St. Lambert Lock, the first lock in the seaway. Over. Are you the first ship in the, in the lock this spring? Yes, we're the first ship. The seaway's not open yet. It'll be opening about 8 o'clock this morning, and we'll be the first ship into the lock. Over. Well, the chances are that, that you'll be the first ship to dock in the port of Detroit, right? You intend to be, don't you, Captain? Yeah, that's right. As far as I can see, we should be up there first ship this year. Over. We know you have a very precious cargo, Captain. What is your cargo? Well, uh, most of it's whiskey. We've got over a thousand tons of it there. Over. <laughs> Take care of that good whiskey, Captain. And have a nice trip, and uh, we'll look for another progress report on Monday, okay? Okay, JP. Thank you very much indeed. Overnight. Eight o'clock, and the seaway is open. Dressed fore and aft, the Carrigan head slides along the approach wall into the St. Lambert Lock, the first ship into the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1967. opened one week later than last year, well, Captain, but it's predicted that the thousand mile waterway will carry about 60 million tons more shipping than it did in 1966. First ship through the seaway entrance was the British freighter Carrigan Head. She was followed through by a Canadian ship and a Russian freighter. The captain of the first ship to go through the seaway gets a centennial flag and plaque to mark the occasion. The race to the St. Lambert Lock is over. The congratulations ended and we're away on the next leg of the race. Through the other locks and across the 500 miles of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie to Detroit. Behind us coming into the lock are other and faster ships than the Carrigan Head. We shall need all the good luck that the boys wave to us from the International Bridge. It seems impossible that any ship could be manoeuvred into such a narrow gap, but it's done calmly and well. Each man knows what to do and what everyone else in the crew will be doing. There are 15 locks like this on the seaway, average length 860 feet, 80 feet wide and walls 40 to 50 feet high. When the gates are closed, 20 million gallons of water will lift us 40 feet or more in about eight minutes. Between Montreal and Detroit, 
we would be lifted nearly 600 feet above sea level. It's as if you were sailing your ship in the hills. We've left the narrow confines of the locks for the broader spaces of the river and the island houses of one of Canada's summer resorts just beginning to come to life after the winter. Behind us, the next ship is clearing the lock we've just left. Ahead of us, 36 hours of hard work and hard steaming. Full speed across the lakes, but coming down to snail's pace for the many locks we've still got to negotiate before we reach Detroit. Early Monday morning, the water ahead of us is clear and we are the first ship into Detroit and we tell them so. One after another, the tugs and dockside factories sound their greetings and as the news of our arrival spreads beyond the waterfront, from his studio in the city, J.P. McCarthy interrupts his morning record program for another interview with the captain. Hello, J.P. This is Captain Sellers on the Carrigan Head. Good morning to you. Over. Good morning, Captain. Did you win the race? Oh, yes. There's nobody else in sight as far as I see. Oh, that's great. Listen, Captain, tell you what. Let's put it on the air uh, right now. Can you stand by? Yes, yeah, standing by. It's at 19 before 8 o'clock. We made contact with uh, the Captain Sellers of the uh, Carrigan Head, and we'll get the uh, story on the exciting race in the St. Lawrence Seaway uh, from Montreal to Detroit. Good morning, Captain. Uh, good morning, JP. Over. Well, we hear you loud and clear. You sound like you're awfully close to our... Now, Captain, uh, this was indeed a race because there were at least two Japanese ships, the Mayasan Maru, and uh, the other one, I, I don't know the name of, that, that we're fighting it out with you. How did the race go, and did you, in fact, win? Well, we're first alongside the berth, and there's no other ship whatsoever anywhere close to us. I haven't heard any of the Japanese talking. I don't know where they are at all. Well, we congratulate you, Captain. I think there's going to be a big celebration today in Detroit. Listen, uh, how is your cargo? Once again, it's booze, sir, <laughs> isn't it? Oh yes, we've got just over a thousand tons there and uh, we'll be getting uh, that discharged this afternoon or maybe sometime this morning depending on when we can get gangs. We'll be getting out of shore for you, over. Well, uh, Captain, we salute you and the, uh, the crew of the good ship Carrigan Head and congratulations again for being the first ship in the port of Detroit in 1967. Uh, thank you very much, JP, over nine. Hey, okay, bye, Captain. On behalf of Mayor Cavanaugh, it's our pleasure to present to you this trophy for being the first foreign ship in the port of Detroit this year. Well, thank you very much indeed, sir. It's a pleasure to receive this trophy. Uh, the more times, the better as far as we're concerned. Well, wonderful, Captain. Thank you very much indeed. While the celebrations of victory are still going on, the ship is unloaded as quickly as possible, but five hours are lost through delays. The news, as we prepare to leave Detroit on the last leg of the race, is that a Yugoslav ship is only two and a half hours behind us and is sailing straight through to Chicago. In the dark, we see no sign of her. The impersonal sweep of the radar and the watchful eye of the mate are concentrated on the channel ahead. Morning finds us with 300 miles to go to Chicago, and there's fresh news of our nearest rival. The next ship behind us, as far as we know, is the Matko Nodillo, which is a Yugoslav vessel, and which is something the same speed as this, this ship is. Uh, when we left Detroit last night, we figured she was two and a half hours steaming time behind us. However, uh, there's ice conditions uh, westward of the Mackinac Ridge, now, this could let the other ship catch up on us quite easily, but at the same time, he would be uh, caught on the ice as well. Uh, 
the only thing is that we may both have to wait and come through together, in which case we'd start off pretty well level on the race, and then it's just a case of uh, who would get there first, and very little difference in speed between the two ships would make all the difference. Chicago morning. On the radio telephone, the ship's agent, speaking to the captain, confirms that the Natco Nodillo is still an hour behind us. For the Carrigan Head, it's been a great race. First into the Seaway, first into Detroit, and now first into Chicago. Nothing remains but to enjoy the splendid spectacle of the city's welcome. Sellers, on behalf of our great mayor, Richard J. Daly, we welcome you to the greatest seaport in the United States. And on behalf of the people of Chicago, I'd like to present you with the flag of Chicago, and may it fly long and uh, forever. Thank you very much. Open the flag up a little bit. Well, uh, the representative of uh, Mayor Daly, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to be the first master of the first ship into Chicago. We have had a pretty good race from Montreal. We left there last Friday, and it's been hard going all the way to keep in front of the other ships. The next ship is only about an hour behind us. He's going to dock very shortly. But I am indeed proud and honoured at the reception that's been given to us today. Thank you very much indeed for this reception. Good day, sir. For the Carrigan Head, it's been a great race, but she is a working ship. At the end of it all, the company is more interested in dividends than trophies. The race, the victories and the celebrations are pleasant interludes, no more. For a ship and her work, there's no beginning and no end. There's always another voyage, another cargo, another port, and the never-ending struggle with the sea. <laughs> 